I was going over to celebrate Mass. I was the pastor at St. James the Apostle Parish in New Bedford, Pennsylvania. And we had a morning Mass. I walked outside. I saw it was a beautiful morning. And recently, at that time, I had received my own pilot's license. And a friend of mine was flying. And I looked up at the sky and I said, what a great day to fly. And I knew he was up. And I thought, well, maybe after Mass, I'll get to go. So I went over and I celebrated Mass. And as I was coming out of church, there were some people who showed up and said, hey, Father Matt, there was a plane that went into one of the towers in New York. I said, oh my gosh, on a beautiful day like this has to be weird. And so I went over to the house and turned on the television. And as I was watching, the second plane went into the tower. I thought, well, we knew right then there was something not right. And then this, it unfolded when I heard that we were going up to Pentagon and then Shanksville, well, it was Western Pennsylvania. I knew that was going to involve our local office. And so at that point, I thought, oh my gosh. So then I checked in with the Newcastle office, which was near us and it was in our territory. And I asked them if there was anything they needed, I was available. And they checked and then they called me back and said, yeah, we want you to report to Shanksville tomorrow. It struck me as so surreal. Uh, it felt like you were walking on to like a movie set because you, know, there was, you could see the trees that were singed. And the way it was on that day was kind of like an overlook. It was naturally formed from the terrain. And I was taken to the command post there by the state police because they were already taking care of the border, and making sure that everything was secured. When I arrived, I, I was rather quickly requested to help with the families of the victims who would be arriving. And that was an unusual thing because normally as a chaplain, we take care of our personnel, FBI employees. But to be involved with the victims was something new but they thought that that would be helpful and that I could be kind of a liaison between uh, the Bureau and the families in terms of some of these visits that they knew families would want to come and see the site. Their first question was, uh, did you consecrate the ground? Did you bless the ground? And that is exactly what I did the very moment I arrived there. I came down, walked over, was looking over the site, and I did the prayers of internment and prayed for all who lost their lives there and blessed the ground. So when I met with the family um, later, I could say, yes, I did do that. And then they began to tell me uh, the story of their loved one. Yeah, that was quite a moment where um, I'm standing there and I know that um, doing this and what has happened here and the significance of it all for our whole country was a very moving for me personally. But I was really focusing on the lives that were lost and the families that are grieving them. And just trying to, as a priest, as a chaplain, bring God's blessing on this tragic place. And the thing is, I really believe, and in all religions, there's a sense that God brings about good out of evil. So what I was praying and thinking about as I was doing that, I definitely recall to this day, was the power of God to bring about good even out of evil. So we have this terrible attack, and yet all hope is not lost. God will, in his providence, bring about good even out of this. Well, it was rather easy because every person who was before me was someone I was feeling the need to care for. So there was a chain of communication that was regular. I was being called upon when people arrived and needed something. Many times 
we would go right to the overlook that had formed there. They had, I believe it was the commander of the state police that put up a cross. And then people started putting their mementos and uh, their prayers, their, their little um, expressions of love and on this little fence that had been put up too. And that's where we would look at the site, say a prayer, and give them some time of quiet. And also the FBI leadership would come out and they would explain to the families what they were viewing and what was taking place and answer any of their questions. And then I would lead a prayer and then they would have time to just be there for a while, uh, lay whatever they wanted to at the site and then we would take them back to Seven Springs. There, there are several families that I do keep in touch with and they keep in touch with me. And we, we were also at the hearing of the cockpit voice recorder, so uh, some of those bonds uh, were solidified there. The interesting thing with that was uh, some family members were at the crash site and did not go to the hearing of the cockpit voice recorder and vice versa. So that was an interesting thing. But you know, we kept in touch with some of those folks. Uh, some family members, some people that I encountered there, even um, the people like from United, some you remember, some keep in touch. Some I think don't keep in touch because they don't want to remember, they don't want to go back, they, they just want to move on. So that's okay too. Well, that's always a concern. Mm -hmm. Even as the chaplaincy with the FBI, we're, we're always being reminded in our training sessions with the Bureau itself that this is a chaplaincy, like a military chaplaincy, where you are caring for everyone of every faith background. And even people who, who don't have a particular uh, faith in God at all, but we're there for everyone. So the thing is the, the listening skills, the just being present, supportive, encouraging, and, and sometimes that presence is what we often refer to as the ministry of presence. Just being there is very helpful to folks. So, but planning the prayer service then when you know you have a mixed group is, is very touchy. But when I remember when I got up to say something, I had been praying over this and thinking about it, struggling with it for a while. I said, I have to pull this together somehow. And the big thing was that I sensed too, was so many people were stressed. I mean, all the talks were very serious and heavy and it was, you could just feel the weight on everyone. And I, I felt called to do something that I knew was very dangerous and that was to give them a little comic relief. And, and um, I thought of a story that I wanted to tell that I thought might do it. So much to, to my delight, everyone bushed out laughing. And I think it was just built up stress and they just needed an excuse to, to let it off and they did. And I looked around and I saw Mrs. Bush laughing and I thought, okay, well, we're good then. <laughs> I was so impressed with the love, the sincerity, the effort of all of these different organizations and agencies to work together. And you could just feel that camaraderie that desire on the part of everyone involved, even though they had different opinions, different responsibilities, but they, they, really, they really came together in a beautiful way. And I believe that when you see the FBI personnel interacting with the state police, with uh, other agencies of, of a, a brotherhood and sisterhood that really, I think, was very patriotic but went deeper than that. It was a sign of humanity coming together in compassion and love and cooperation. And that still sticks with me to this day. And we did it then, we can do it now. I said back then, they will want to have a memorial here and it'll be of granite and stone and glass and precious things, but the only real memorial and the best memorial 
that we could make for those who lost their lives here and in the other attacks is the difference it makes in the way we live, in the difference we make now in their honor and memory. But the change is not in what we do on this site. It's what this site and what's occurred here does in us.